Good evening and welcome to Making Michigan, the Bentley Library's series on the history of the University of Michigan. I'm Gary Krenz. I'm pleased to be here with our presenter tonight, Terry McDonald. On behalf of the Bentley, welcome. We want to take a moment to acknowledge the historical, that the historical origins and present locations of the university were made possible by cession of lands by Anishinaabe and Wyandotte peoples under coercive treaties common in the colonization and expansion of the United States. We note in particular the grant of land made by the Anishinaabe under the Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids for the college at Detroit so that their children could be educated. These lands continue to be the homeland of indigenous people, and we seek to reaffirm and respect their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and to recognize their contributions to the University of Michigan. This evening, we will learn about the university's rise to greatness, according to some measures, and how the ways in which those measures changed had an impact on the university for good or ill. Our guide in this exploration will be Terry McDonald, Arthur F. Thurnau Professor, Professor of History and Director of the Bentley Historical Library at the University of Michigan. Before coming to the Bentley in 2013, he served for 10 years as Dean of, the, of UM's College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, the university's largest college. Terry is, is an award-winning an award historian of the United States. He has been a Guggenheim National Endowment for the Humanities and U of M Humanities Institute Fellow. He is the author or editor of four books and numerous articles and has served on the editorial boards of the journals Social Science History, Social Science History pardon me, Historical Methods and Studies in American Political Development. He is also, I might add, in addition to being an accomplished historian of the U.S. and an accomplished administrator, a student of higher education and of the University of Michigan in particular. Terry, welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening and the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Gary. And welcome everyone uh, this evening. Uh, I'm uh, looking forward to talking with you tonight. And uh, no, I am not really broadcasting from the stacks of the Bentley Historical Library, but that is the backdrop I've chosen for this evening to remind us all that uh, sadly we are on remote work most of the time. And so the Bentley Library is not widely available, although it is uh, for a few hours a week for the members of the U of M community only. So we miss seeing you and we miss seeing you face to face. Uh, and all of us uh, are looking forward to the time when we will be able to uh, talk face to face about these issues, uh, but also in the future when we will be able to do it both ways, both virtually and face to face, because one of the great advantages of our remote situation, ironically, is that many more people are able to actually attend the presentations that we have been enjoying in this past year uh, from the Bentley Historical Library. So tonight's talk is uh, entitled Pathways to Greatness, How the University of Michigan Became a World-Class University and What It Cost. I wanted to start by reminding you that I've got those scare quotes around world-class, because of course one question I'm going to investigate tonight is what exactly is a world-class university? Um, and uh, in, the, in the lecture, I'm going to be looking at Michigan's ranking in a number of uh, national and international ranking systems and then try to figure out the origins of those rankings. How did they happen? What were the factors that drove the University of Michigan to the history of rankings um, that we're gonna take a look at as we go through it tonight? Before I turn to the uh, formal topic of my talk, I'd like to uh, mention a couple of resources. Those of you that are interested in the history of the university, uh, uh, under Gary's leadership, we have launched a new website, and here it is. It's called History of UM. If you just put in Google History of UM, lowercase, just like that, it will take you to this fabulous cornucopia of information about the history of the university. Almost anything you would like to know about the university, schools and colleges of the university, uh, the timelines of various units of the university, the, the uh, university's own uh, encyclopedic history, all these things are available on that website. So if you are a fan of university history, uh, please take a look there and, and uh, you'll be really surprised at how many resources are available. The second thing I want to mention is uh, another source of contemporary information, and that's the so-called uh, Michigan Almanac. Uh, this is a publication produced by the provost's office at the university. And if you put in UMich Provost Almanac, this page will pop up with this table of contents of that almanac. 
This is an absolutely fabulous compendium of information about the university. Many, many questions that you might wanna have answered for yourself, for friends, for young people that are thinking of attending the university are actually answered here in, the, uh, in, the, in, the in this almanac. And here's the table of contents. It's an overview, undergraduate admissions, affordability, student success, et cetera. And uh, you'll see chapter 12 is academic and reputation rankings and some of the things that I'm going to be uh, talking about tonight, some of the tables I'm gonna be looking at are actually uh, from that chapter. So if you wanna check my, check my sources tonight, you can actually turn to the uh, Provost Almanac. Uh, colleagues of mine at other universities have said that they find this a quite remarkable amount of transparency on the part of the university. So we should all take advantage of it and learn what we can uh, from this really uh, useful uh, compendium of information. Well, okay, to the topic at hand. Uh, and let's start off with our first question of the evening. What exactly is a world-class university? Well, sadly, no one exactly knows. Uh, this uh, expert on higher education says everybody wants one and certainly developing countries very much want one. No country feels like it can do without one. The problem is that no one knows what a world-class university is and no one has figured out how to get one. Uh, and that has made the developmental question for many countries, what could we do to get a world-class university quite complicated? Uh, that's also the theme that has stimulated my research tonight that has led to this presentation. Well, okay, fine, let's take one world-class university, one university that ends up being world-class and try to figure out what was it? that actually produced that possibility uh, in, the, and, and in the course of its, of its history. But today, if you wanna know what a world-class university is, you don't go to the dictionary, you go to the rating services. So here we have the granddaddy of them all, the US News and World Report rankings of the best global universities, which they, by the way, have been doing only since 2016. Now this list is the list of the American global universities. There would be other international universities if we were looking at it, but I'm looking at the American, at the status of Michigan vis-a-vis -vis its American peer, peers throughout, throughout this evening. Now I'm gonna show you a couple of graphs and we're not gonna spend a lot of time with it. Most of the time, I just want you to look at one thing and you know what that is. That's gonna be the line that says University of Michigan. Uh, and I'll call your attention to that. On these graphs, the blue is usually private and the gold is usually public. So the US News, as some of you know, began ranking universities and colleges in 1983 uh, and only somewhat later actually began ranking them around the world. So for most of the history of the US News and World Report rankings, the rankings were of American universities only. In 2016, it began ranking universities around the world and it ranks a lot of universities. So this most recent one for 2020, there were 1500 universities ranked. And here we have the University of Michigan number 17. I want to emphasize what a remarkable feat that is to be the 17th best university in the world out of 1,500 ranked uh, by this kind of longstanding ranking service, the U.S. News and World Report. Well, there actually are other ranking systems uh, as well. In fact, there are four major ranking systems. U.S. News is the granddaddy, but these other ranking systems actually got going after that. The first ranking system to do the uh, world universities, in fact, was the Academic Ranking World University Survey, which is the ARWU, published in Shanghai, uh, China. In that survey in 2020, university was number 22 out of 1,000. The world university rankings from the Times Higher Education Supplement of 2020. University of Michigan is number 22 out of 1,400 universities ranked. The QS World University Rankings, University of Michigan is number 21 out of 1,000 universities. Uh, these studies, all these groups all started going after 2003 uh, and they're all basically uh, ranking annually or semi-annually just about every university in the world. And you can see the numbers are quite large and the performance of Michigan in these rankings is actually quite excellent and, and, uh, and impressive. So we are a highly ranked world-class university because everyone says we are. And that, by the way, is the definition of this uh, everywhere. Uh, it's the only way that a world-class university is defined, that it is identified as such 
by being at the top of an international survey of universities. Now, what does this mean in reality? Of course, it's always complicated. Ranking systems are done for profit by private entities. Every one of these ranking services is a business and they make a living selling rankings to a variety of customers. All their data and analysis is private. They oftentimes publish their formulas. Okay, this, this percentage is based on this and this percentage is based on that. But no self-respecting academic organization in America, or for that matter in the world, ranks universities these days. This is all private. Uh, and there are many of them today. These ranking systems have multiplied since 1983. These are the main international ones, the ones I've just shown you. But there are as many, almost every magazine in America now seems to have a ranking system for universities of one kind or another. And they've all been developed to shore up the shrinking revenue of traditional media. So this is an income strategy, a revenue strategy for traditional media uh, to build a ranking system of some kind and to publish that. I mentioned this because some of you tonight might be parents or grandparents or friends of, of young people who are looking, thinking about where should I go to college and we should be getting into these rankings. And my Lord, you could order a, a shelf of books and magazines on ranking. And it's very important to uh, be a little bit skeptical of those things. They're all being done to encourage you, of course, to buy a publication. Um, and their systems change a lot. And quite frankly, oftentimes the hardest thing to measure is the undergraduate experience as we'll see as we go on tonight. But one thing is common in all of them, and that is some kind of reputational survey is an important aspect of just about every ranking system. The percentage that uh, the reputation adds to the ranking varies from study to study, from uh, uh, survey group to survey group. But no ranking is possible without some reference to reputation. And therefore, uh, the question of, the next question that's pretty important then is, uh, Basically, how did the University of Michigan develop a reputation for excellence? Well, it turns out that this was also through previous surveys. So for most of the 20th century, longer than we realize, and this is something that uh, I and my colleagues were able to dig out of the, of the records at the Bentley, uh, there have been uh, a, a quite a good number of, of surveys that were conducted by academic organizations, uh, and they were exclusively on, on American universities. And Michigan actually did surprisingly well in those surveys, almost from the beginning of the 20th century. So here is one that we dug out. This is the first time I think most people have ever seen the very first attempt to rank American universities done in 1908 by the Carnegie Foundation for uh, University and College Teaching. Now you see they're doing something very crude here. They're ranking universities based on their, on their total annual income and they're dividing it here by the number of students uh, and they're just basically coming up with these numbers. So really you get ranked if you're spending enough money. Here we have Columbia, Harvard, Chicago, but there's Michigan right in this top list in 1908. Uh, it's fun to see the tuitions. Here's the tuition at Columbia, $150. Here's the tuition at Michigan, $30. So there was certainly a difference in what you would, might pay for appropriately ranked universities. But something interesting, expenditure will be a component of every almost every ranking system after this. So from 1983 on, the amount of money spent on various activities is almost always going to be in every ranking of international universities. So here we have an interesting fact that in 1908, Michigan is being ranked already uh, as one of the best universities in America. Now, this is another somewhat hairy graph. It's the last kind of hairy one. Uh, I'm only interested in one thing. So just I'll take you through what I care about. And there's just at the top, I want you to see that there were a bunch of ranking attempts throughout the 20th century. And shocker, I wanna just look at what happened to the University of Michigan. So it turns out that a number of academics and academic enterprises began ranking universities pretty early in the 20th century. One of the first ones was done in 1925. This is an individual investigator, another individual, another individual, another individual. All these were individual investigators or teams of investigators. This one was very, very important. The National Research Council attempt to evaluate universities across the country. The first really deep and systematic attempt of a real highly respectable academic organization to do ranking and the last. So in 1925, 1934, and 1959, all these studies were done of trying to rank uh, the universities in the country. Uh, 
Uh, and this uh, investigator who has put together this table actually tried to come up with a way that he could compare them across different universities. In some cases, for example, these were studies just of departments. And then you would add up how many high ranked departments were there and develop a kind of an index for the overall reputation uh, of the university. And here's Michigan again. 1925, 8, 34, 8, 59, 5, 66, 4, 74, 79, 5, and the very important NRC investigation 8 uh, nationally. And he's trying to figure out what kind of change was there across the shape of these surveys. And in fact, in the case of Michigan, it really wasn't that much change. So throughout the 20th century, as these surveys measured it and notice their reputational rankings. They would send a questionnaire to various figures. They could, in some cases, they were faculty, in some cases, they were administrators, and they would say, uh, what are the 10 best uh, departments in your, in your field? They would then recalculate that into a university-wide evaluation based on those, on those answers. And the University of Michigan was uh, actually uh, very distinguished all the way through the 20th century. Now, of course, we've discovered something that makes a historian's heart beat fast, and that is that, well, if we want to explain the rise of the University of Michigan, we're driven back into the 19th century. And that's the kind of thing that makes a historian happy to hear that history has an impact uh, on something, and it's kind of surprising. So I honestly would have said, if you had asked me, when did the university start to be a highly ranked university in the United States, I would never have thought that it was going to be 1908 or 1925 before I began this work. And it turns out it was. And therefore, that means that it had to have achieved some measure. It had to have done something right in the, uh, throughout the course of the 19th century. And I think there's something to that. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what factors might have made the university in a position already by the early 20th century to be ranked very highly. And I'm going to talk about four things that I think did this, there could be many more and we wouldn't have enough time for them all. And there could be ones that you might consider important that I'm not gonna talk about tonight. I'd be happy to address in the question period. These are constitutional autonomy, substantial resources, a commitment to diversity expressed in a variety of ways. And of course, some visionary leadership that actually put these things together uh, and moved the university in directions that was going to get, the, get it ready to be evaluated uh, by these by these ranks. Now, I want to say at the beginning, that not all of these things were necessarily going to be cost free or perfect. So the visionary leadership saw the university should move in a certain direction. It meant that other directions weren't going to be taken up. Uh, so there were things that were obviously there were costs and benefits of all these measures that were that were taken. So let's take a look at constitutional autonomy. You have heard about this before, if you've paid attention to the history of the university, people, people refer to this often. What exactly does it mean that the University of Michigan has constitutional autonomy and when did this happen? Well, constitutional autonomy as a court decision in the state of Michigan has had it, declares that the regents who of course run the university and, and legally are the university, compose the highest form of juristic person known in the law, a constitutional corporation, of independent authority, which within the scope of its functions, functions of the regions, is coordinate with and equal to that of the legislature. So the con concept of constitutional autonomy is that the University of Michigan Board of Regions is in the state constitution as a branch of the government that is equivalent and not subservient to the executive and legislative branches. Now, somewhat surprisingly, this actually was put in the Constitution in 1850. And this is what that Constitution said. The regents of the university shall constitute the body corporate. The regents of the University of Michigan shall have general supervision of the university and the direction and control of all expenditures, and they shall be elected. This meant that the board, our current board, and all the, way, all the boards that have come up since 1850 have a democratic mandate. They're elected in the same election where we select the governor and the state legislature, for example. They have a specialized function. They run only the university and they are a constitutional and not legislative entity. They are not created by the state legislature and they're not appointed by the governor. So that means they are autonomous of both and have their own constitutional standing. What difference would that make 
for the history of the university. Well, at the Constitutional Convention in the 1850s, the, uh, the, the, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention knew what difference it would make because they, they talked about this in terms of their own knowledge that in public universities around the state of Michigan, they noticed they could be ruined by political interference. And they wanted to have a situation for this university, and keep in mind it was the only university in 1850 in the state, that would not be ruined by political interference. And so the idea was to give the regents the authority and the power and the autonomy to build the university that they thought would be uh, the best. And that meant that there wasn't going to be a different political agenda every time there was a change in the electoral prospects. And that has been available to the university since 1850. Uh, in the 1950s, both Wayne State and Michigan State were given the same status. And it's made a significant difference in the history of these universities. Well, somewhat surprisingly, the second thing then is substantial resources. And you might say, gee, in the 19th century, I mean, how could people have money that they could, how could they afford to give money to the university? And certainly times were hard throughout much of the 19th century. Well, it turns out the university actually did quite well. So between 1867 and 1899 and in, in 19th century dollars, it got $3,668,434. In 2020 dollars, that's 98 million. In other words, almost $1 billion from the state between 1867 and 1899. It's quite astounding. Now, how did that happen? Uh, of course, it did help that there was only one university in those days, uh, that it was quite small at the beginning. But what happened was the university actually negotiated with the state legislature to be given an actual share of the state property tax millage. So as you can see, beginning in 1867, the university was granted 1 20th of a mill. And this kept going and going. And by 1893, it got larger. In 1899, it was a fourth of a mill. And what that meant was as the entire property value of the state went up, the money automatically came to the university. There was no state appropriation for higher education. There was simply a payment to the university of its share of the state property tax. And the state of Michigan began to be very, very powerful economically in the late 19th and early 20th century. And the fact that the university was actually in the property tax millage was going to produce a great deal of, uh, of funding. And then there were other projects that this, the state funded buildings for schools and colleges, books for the library, separately from these appropriations, from, these, uh, from this millage as well. Now, this became an absolute bonanza after the turn of the century when it felt like there was an automobile plant opening almost every week in the state of Michigan. So during the 19 teens and 20s, this millage percentage was a Niagara of, of money coming into the university and was going to make a huge difference. One of the reasons why if you walk around the main campus today, you'll see many, many buildings that were built in the 1920s was because the amount of money in the state property tax uh, valuation was so high in those days. And that uh, money flew, the share of that money flew directly into the university. So we had substantial resources and we had a board which working with the president and the faculty could develop the university any way they wanted, any way they wanted or in the best way that they, that they th thought they could. The university also then began to have a commitment to diversity which was going to have multiple effects over the, over the course of time. The first step of this was the admission of women in 1870. This was a was not an uncontroversial measure. The University of Michigan began, as most universities in America were, as an all-male place in 1837. Beginning in the 1850s and 60s, uh, women and their parents began to contact the regions and ask about the possibility of admission. There were many, many theories about why women could not uh, succeed in higher education and why women and men should not mix in higher education. And finally, the advocates got enough members of the board to vote in favor of admission. You see it was not unanimous, six yes, two no, on this important change. And, and it was in a very interesting resolution that actually was passed. The board recognizes the right of every resident of Michigan to the enjoyment of the privileges afforded by the university, and that no rule exists in any of the university statutes for the exclusion of any person from the university who possesses the requisite literary and moral qualifications. What this meant was that all background factors, gender, race, and religion were all of a sudden written out beginning in 1870. 
and this was going to have a number of substantially important long-term effects on the history of the university. For one thing, as we can see in this table, uh, the number of women uh, was going to grow significantly. So here we, most of them were in the College of LSNA, which would remember was called the Literary College in those days. So we had one in 1869, 70, 62, 81, 119, 284, 494. So the number of women in the university began to grow apace uh, and was rapidly growing. There were two major effects of the admission of women, uh, undoubtedly more, but certainly at least two. One, the intellectual quality of the student body went up. Yes, sorry, men. On average, in the 19th century and even into the 20th century, uh, female students are better students. Uh, and in those days, we're much more committed to intellectual life than were the men who might have been distracted by things like athletics and uh, that, that sort of thing. Uh, moreover, the women were attracted to disciplines that were different from those of the men. And of course, many of these were the humanities disciplines. So the effect of coeducation was not only that the intellectual level of the university went up, but that the uh, humanities were strengthened simply because of the demand for courses in literature, languages, et cetera, uh, which might have been more frequently available, to, uh, chosen by women than by men who, for example, might want to go into engineering and other areas like this. So the interesting thing about this change, one interesting thing about this change was um, it, it basically raised the level of intellectual life on the campus. And it's quite remarkable how many intellectual societies and associations and publications and all these things were already going uh, in the late uh, 1880s and 1890s, for example. Now, it also was going to have an effect on another important controversy, uh, which is characterized by these two dates. In 1922, the Ivy League colleges of the East began a desperate, deplorable, rancorous discussion over whether they should impose a quota on the number of Jewish students in their universities. This was a deplorable outcome of anti-immigrant sentiment in the 1920s, uh, obviously an example of anti-Semitism and a really, really shocking uh, debate at some of the highest ranked universities in America. Uh, this debate never happened at the University of Michigan. And that's of course, because the 1870 resolution made it impossible. You could not be prevented from attending the university based on your religion. This signal that this sent in the 1920s and 30s was going to have a very beneficial effect on the standing of the university in the long run too. As you know, many famous alums from the East came to the university, Arthur Miller among them, uh, quite simply because they felt they would have a better chance at Michigan than they would at one of the Ivy League schools. Uh, and so this was going to have a long, this commitment here was going to have a long-term effect, again, going back to the decision made uh, in 1870. Well, of course, with, so we've got a setup now, which is a autonomy from the state legislature that is so distinctive and so different from that in most states that it's almost as if the university was a, was a private university in those days, as the term public ivy applies to Michigan precisely because of its constitutional autonomy. We had quite remarkably abundant resources already in the late 19th century. We had sent a message to the country, to students, to faculty, to others, that we were open to all comers who are interested in the intellectual life of the university. And that was going to be a powerful amalgam onto which and into which we're going to come some of these really visionary leaders of the late 19th century who were going to have an impact on the future of the university then too. Well, of course, the first one was Henry Tappan. President Tappan was the first president of the university, the first formal president of the university. He came in 1852, left in 1863. And on the day that he delivered his inaugural address, he delivered some shocking news to the listeners. And that was that there are no true universities outside of Prussia, including this one. The University of Michigan was not uh, a, uh, a true university. And that's because there, it wasn't doing enough research. So President Tappan was convinced that the distinction between a college and a university, a mere college, as he would frequently say, and by the way, he used to refer to the Ivy League as mere colleges compared to Michigan, uh, was the difference between uh, them was the, those that did true, a true university would combine research with facilities to support that work in addition to the teaching. 
and he began making decisions. He was the person who built the Detroit Observatory. Uh, here it is in, in, in its very early days. The, the observatory now, of course, is under the control of the Bentley, and we're doing a big project uh, to make it more available to more uh, users. It'll hopefully open up next year. He built the first chemistry lab in 1858, the new medical building in 1859. He made massive investments in the library. In other words, in every way that he could, he, made, he changed the conditions on the campus in the direction of research. Now, there were some costs to this. Uh, he decided that the uh, buildings on the university should be only for teaching and research. Uh, prior to this, they had actually been dormitories. So he basically told the students, uh, you need to find your housing elsewhere. And so from 1857 until 1914, there were no dormitories at the University of Michigan. The buildings on the campus were for academic work only. Uh, and students had to find their way into private boarding houses where they would try to find room and board. And this was gonna be a complexity for students. So here's an example of where a decision that turns out to be powerful in the long run, um, in the short term, uh, had both beneficial and less beneficial consequences. It was great for the faculty. Uh, it wasn't so good for students who were gonna to have to sometimes struggle uh, for housing, in particular, if they were members of underrepresented groups. Uh, in those days, of course, landlords uh, were very, uh, uh, wary of renting to anyone other than men when, because that's the way the college uh, had begun. Well, the second person who made a big impact, of course, was James Angel. Angel Hall is named after him, as many of you know. Uh, he was president 1871 to 1909, and he served in the days when the university was beginning its quite rapid kind of growth, but in the days when administration was quite underdeveloped, and so the president himself personally approved the admission of every student and hired every faculty member. If you worked at the University of Michigan between 1871 and 1909, you were hired by President Angel. Uh, and he hired some of the most outstanding faculty in America and built the faculty to 285 by 1908. He also approved the founding of the graduate school in 1892. So essentially he took again, the same combination of possibilities, the research environment constructed by Tappan, the, uh, rapidly professionalizing faculty around the country, the, uh, the desire of faculty to train graduate students and got them all underway uh, already by, by 1982. He himself uh, was never thought to have been a, a great intellectual leader, but he had tremendous taste in the faculty that are hired. Uh, here are three of them. Some of the most important people of the 19th century is Frederick Novi, the father of bacteriology who was hired for the, uh, for the medical school. This is a very, very young John Dewey, the most famous philosopher in America. Those days and ever since, uh, he joined the university faculty in, in 1882. Uh, this is Henry Carter Adams, the founder of our economics department, founder of our business school, the first economist of the Interstate Commerce Commission in the 1890s, and really one of the most important economists of the late 19th century, who Angel hired after he had been fired by Cornell because he was too sympathetic with labor. So interestingly enough, Angel was not only a good judge of talent, but from time to time willing to take risks um, in these appointments as well. Angel's crowning achievement or uh, something that happened during his, uh, during his um, presidency was the founding of the Association of American Universities, which to this day, is the leading organization of the research intensive universities of the United States. So this began to be organized uh, in 1900. A call was sent out from the presidents of the University of Chicago, Columbia, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, and University of California to try to rationalize and define graduate education by bringing together the major universities that were doing the most research and producing the most graduate students to try to guide that whole part of higher education's mission. There were originally 11 members, three public, and Michigan was one of the public uh, universities involved in that. The Association of American Universities is still the top organization of research universities in America today. There are 64 members. It is invitation only, so you cannot be admitted to the uh, group with, with all the other members of the group approving it, and it's entirely based on your research and graduate education so that if you decide to stop doing research as a university, for example, Syracuse uh, some years ago decided to be less research intensive uh, and was dropped. So it clearly uh, 
prioritizes that kind of uh, that kind of work. But it's a very uh, prestigious and distinguished um, organization, which Michigan uh, was a co-founder at the uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. So these things were all going together. You had the autonomy of the board and presidents to move a university in a direction driven by universities priorities and by the growing network of universities in America. You had an open door to students and faculty from a variety of backgrounds. Michigan was not a paradise for those groups by any means, but at least the door was open in many other places it wasn't. Many, the first women in the Ivy League began in 1969, almost a hundred years after the university admitted its women in 1870. Uh, and it had this uh, ability to therefore collect these really outstanding faculty members uh, to uh, join the faculty. Now, in his really important book that some of you have probably read, Jim Collins, his book called Good to Great, he's talking about the process by which this actually, you develop a kind of a momentum. He calls this the flywheel effect. You're building momentum by building the brand. So, you bring people in who have ideas and who wanna be part of something that's gonna be really quite significant. You begin to dis dis demonstrate the results of those decisions by the intellectual life on the campus, by the publications of the faculty, by the quality of the graduate students. You're therefore building the brand in many ways by the alumni that go out into the world and work, by the universities that hire your graduate students to join the faculty. Uh, you begin to attract people who invest in your mission their time, their money. And then this becomes a kind of a virtuous circle where the flywheel gets going and basically uh, it becomes a sort of a, a perpetual motion machine if you're lucky. It doesn't mean it has to, but it does mean that you can make the leap from good to great once you get this momentum going in the right direction, uh, according to Collins. And in many ways, what we've seen uh, is that the university had the building blocks of this kind of a direction so that once again, going back to the original question, already in 1908, certainly by 1925, it was one of the top ranked universities in America and it, it's been there ever since. Quite a quite remarkable um, level of achievement. Well, what was the effect of these high early rankings? And this, now we're gonna talk a little bit about the cost part uh, of this. Let me say at the outset, to be an organization of any kind, today that has been ranked at the top of its field for a hundred years is an extraordinary accomplishment. So the fact that Michigan was top ranked beginning in 1908 and is top ranked in the world today among the top 25 for sure in the world today in 2000 is an astounding, astounding accomplishment that has persisted through thick and thin. So I wanna begin by saying that looking at this, at this history, it's important to understand how important it is that, uh, that Michigan's ranking has been so high all these years. But it turns out that these ranking systems always do, including today and certainly then, have an effect on the institutions that they're, that they're ranking. And here at the university, this ranking, these rankings, an important part of them was that they were of graduate education only. All of the 20th century rankings after 1908 were of graduate departments and graduate education. They said nothing about the quality of undergraduate education. And that was going to send a message to all these universities, not just Michigan, but to all of these universities about what the priorities were for the operation of the university that wanted to stay highly ranked. Now these were happening. And of course, uh, President Angel was operating at the time when the faculty was being professionalized. Most of the disciplines that we understand today Modern Language Association, American for the English Department, American Historical Association, American Economic Association originated in the 1880s and 1890s and became very powerful uh, after the turn of the 20th century. The first university press was organized in 1892. Uh, the idea increasingly spread that you should have the PhD to teach in universities. By the way, all of those three people I mentioned, uh, the uh, Henry Carter Adams, Frederick Novi, uh, uh, John Dewey came to the university in the 18, when they arrived, Dewey, for example, in the 1882 with the PhD in hand. And this idea that 
what universities did was teach graduate students so they would get the PhD, did, their, did research and published their research was quite widespread and accelerated by the rise of professional associations who also awarded uh, that kind of behavior. This was gonna have an effect on the curriculum. So great as time went on, uh, teaching is of course gonna be more and more based on faculty research, which means it becomes more specialized, but graduate education is gonna become more prestigious. And now this, it's no surprise why. So once again, you are being rated as a university based on your graduate programs. Obviously being in the graduate program is gonna be important for your own identity and prestige. And so basically graduate education is gonna become more prestigious on campus, not, here, not only here, but in every major research university in the country. There's gonna be a shift of teaching loads toward graduate teaching, more graduate teaching, less undergraduate teaching. And somewhat surprisingly, the redefinition of the undergraduate education uh, into majors or concentrations as they were called for many years in Michigan, based on them providing the necessary preparation for graduate education in the field. So the university introduced these concentrations, they're called majors today in 1933. And from then on, there were majors. And all of you probably, many of you in the audience who attended Michigan have a major from Michigan. Uh, it turns out that for a great period of time in the 20th century, they were defined not necessarily by what the best type of undergraduate education might be, but by a, a kind of hypothetical question about what would be the appropriate undergraduate course of study to prepare you for graduate education in that field. Now, you know how this flies in the face of the reality that most students who come to the Michigan don't want to go on in graduate education in those fields. So this was clearly a signal sent to colleagues, not necessarily a curriculum designed to satisfy the needs of undergraduates. So this was, this was torquing the undergraduate curriculum into this question, into this idea that it had to be preparation for graduate school rather than necessarily the kind of education that undergraduates themselves need. Uh, for themselves. Uh, many of you might have had an experience like mine when I remember my brief flirtation with an English major in college was destroyed, I think, either by Middle English or by linguistics. I can't remember which, but it certainly wasn't reading books, which are what I wanted to do. And I now realize, of course, that that idea of what's required for an English major was in many ways affected by this, that these were this was about the sorts of things you should have studied so that you could do graduate work in that field, not necessarily the things that you wanted to do and certainly not necessarily things that might have been perfect for undergraduate education. And you also had a shift among the faculty away from general education. Fewer and fewer faculty wanted to teach distribution type courses. More and more wanted to teach concentrations and majors defined as preparation for graduate study and more and more wanted to teach graduate courses period. And that became the kind of highly ranked uh, idea of prestige on the campus was doing more graduate teaching and less undergraduate teaching. This professionalization of the faculty, the rise of outside organizations, the, the, the credit as it were for research continued. A survey in 1989 found that 70% of academics felt more loyalty to their disciplines than to their institutions. And that was connected to this role of research and graduate education and validated by collegial organizations in your field. And of course, ratified by rankings throughout the 20th century that were evaluating your department and your university based on the graduate curriculum and, and, and the graduate teaching there. Now in 1983, the US News and World Report came on the scene and the first thing they did for the first several years was actually evaluate undergraduate education. This was a shock to the system of the ranking systems of higher education in America. Because as we saw prior to that, every ranking had been of graduate education only. And there was a tremendous scramble that greeted the arrival of the first US News Report surveys in 1983. And uh, the World Report surveys in 1983. And as they began to kind of figure out their method uh, between 1983 and 1987, uh, and they shifted from purely reputational uh, up, uh, the first US News and World Report undergraduate survey went to university presidents, you know, ranked the best undergraduate, the schools with the best undergraduate experience. So from 83 to about 87, it was purely reputational. They then began adding variables and one of them was per capita expenditure on students, uh, which was gonna have a significant effect. So here's the most recent rankings 
Uh, this is for 2020 from the U.S. News and World Report, rankings of national undergraduate universities, U of M and its peers. These are American again. Blue are private, gold are public, and here, of course, is Michigan, 27, 28, 27, 25, 24, but three among publics, the third best public, the 24th best university on the whole. What's the difference? Of course, it's exactly the variable I just mentioned. The privates will always have fewer students and more money, and therefore the expenditure per capita will always be higher among private universities and among public. Uh, and so quite frankly, a ranking of 24 or in, and three among publics for the University of Michigan is actually quite good. And this is related to scale. And therefore these rankings are always going to be disadvantageous to public universities. So the freshman class in Ellison A at Michigan is about the same size as the entire undergraduate student body at Harvard, and maybe even a little bit more than the entire student body at Yale. So you, you can't, if you're a large, excellent public university, you literally cannot catch up with the uh, private universities as long as expenditure per student is going to be in the mix. So there obviously needs to be some refinement here, but nonetheless, it's still important to point out that the university is ranked third among public universities uh, by the US News when it looks at the undergraduate experience. Now, it's very difficult to evaluate a high quality undergraduate experience. And quite frankly, expenditure per capita is the, would only be the very beginning of that possibility. There are many other variables in here, but the truth is, this is the reason it took so long to have ratings of undergraduate experience was it's very hard to measure. And it remains that way today too. So none of these surveys would be gospel in that respect. So here's what we've seen tonight, interestingly enough. We kind of know, and by the way, if I was to uh, put on this screen now, the, uh, an article saying, well, gee, what does it take to be a world-class university? Ironically, many of the things that I've mentioned in the history of the University of Michigan would be mentioned. It turns out that in countries that are trying to develop world-class universities, uh, they're told, yes, you have, to have, you have to have autonomy from political interference, you have to have abundant resources, you have to have good leadership, you have to have openness and diversity. And for some developing countries, all of these things, quite frankly, are very, very hard. For example, the greatest, you know, the, the great competitor now internationally for American universities are the Chinese universities. Uh, they can deliver vast resources. Uh, they can have many, many, many students. But the fact is they cannot operate without political interference. That's going to be a challenge for them uh, as they attempt to rise in the rankings of, of, of uh, international universities. But in any case, in our case, in the history of the University of Michigan tonight, the factors that propelled the university to its high rankings actually happened very early in its history in the 19th century. They put it in the position to be the leading, among the leading universities in America already by, the, uh, by 1908 and certainly by 1925, that standing ratified by its invitation to be one of the co-founders of the Association of American Universities. Uh, when the international, so it was a very, very highly ranked American university for the entire 20th century. And when the new system of rankings, world universities came into play beginning in 2003 with the survey that we talked about, the ARU, ARWU survey in, from Shanghai, it has taken a position as one of the great universities in the world uh, as well. These rankings are incredibly good things. One of the things that's interesting about Michigan is the overlap in the rankings. These systems all have various ways of ranking universities. And they, by the way, change those ways of ranking because of course you don't wanna have the same list year after year. It's one of the challenges of these ranking systems. But to have persisted at this very high level for so long in these rankings, including in the shift to international rankings is quite wonderful worth praise, praising and maintaining for all those whose work and resources um, have gone into these rankings. But every ranking system sends a kind of a signal. Uh, many of you do have heard the management aphorism, what is measured is managed. This is true of universities as is of any large organization. Measurable qualities that appear to be linked with success will ob obviously start to become the core of an organization's or a very important part of an organization's enterprise. And therefore these rankings for much of the 20th century had an impact on the balance 
between graduate and undergraduate education, between teaching and research, between local loyalties that are connected to those, those missions, the undergraduate mission in particular, and, and national and international loyalties connected to professional development and the publication of research. So every ranking system is going to carry a message in it, and the universities are going to respond to that, and the University of Michigan did as well. So one cost of being ranked and paying attention to those rankings, which frankly every university does, is that inevitably the criteria of those ranks will have an effect on the way that you operate as they did here. Uh, today, every university is really, you, you could say, well, why do universities cooperate with this? Well, of course, because it's, it, it appears to be um, damaging not to be ranked. Uh, and so most universities, they're asked for the data, the data originally, some of these data, not the, not the reputational surveys and things like that come from the universities themselves. Uh, but it's very difficult not to be part of that of that ranking system. So it's uh, uh, as I said to begin with, uh, it's it's uh, was a it's a pleasure for a historian to realize that factors quite a bit back in the history of the university played a big role in its stand today, and I've been happy to discover them and to share them with you this evening. And I thank you for your attention. Good night. Thank you, Terry. That was uh, that was wonderful. There's there's a lot in there uh, that we could uh, that we could follow up on a lot to, a lot to unpack further. Uh, but I wonder if we could uh, just follow up on a couple of things, and then uh, open you know turn to audience questions. And I'll just uh, remind the audience uh, now. You know, please put your questions in the Q and A, uh, not in the chat. Uh, that way we'll be uh, uh, we'll be sure to uh, sure to see them. So I wanted to I wanted to start just with a little bit about I mean you, you mentioned at the end about how you know uh, uh, now universities in other parts of the world are trying to sort of follow this model uh, that uh, that draws to some extent on these on these factors that you that you laid out. Uh, but can you say a little bit about the impact of U of M? Uh, in this country, in the in the 19th century, I mean, some of these things were firsts. I mean, the the the, the stream of income that the mill tax provided, uh, the, um, uh, the 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 degree of constitutional uh, autonomy, and so forth. Uh, these were things that were watched by uh, you know states farther west. Uh, want, many wanted to sort of follow that path. Many not successful at doing that. But say University of California uh, seems to be very much built on uh, the Michigan model, so to speak. And I wonder if you have any comments about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly uh, the, the 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 Michigan model um, was enormously influential on state universities um, west of Michigan, uh, as you pointed out. The Constitution of California really was the part involving higher education in California was designed very much on the model of the constitutional autonomy of the, uh, from the state that the University of Michigan had. President Angel was one of the great leaders of higher education. He was offered the presidency of every, you know, almost every university in America at one time or another in the 19th century. Um, so he had a huge influence. He was an advisor to many universities and to other presidents. Uh, the faculty here, of course, were the founders of disciplines. Uh, you know, so John Dewey, for example, <laughs> was a founder of both psychology and philosophy. Uh, well, when he was here and when he went to, off to the University of Chicago, uh, certainly modern economics was deeply influenced the economics of those days by, by Henry Carter Adams. So, so I think that's, it's important to, to point out. I, and it's, it's also interesting to point out what a, how different a place like Michigan was in scale and, uh, and to some extent even ambition. I mean, keep in mind that for the longest time, the Ivy League thought of themselves and wanted to be colleges. They really were not interested in being universities in the same way that Michigan was. So when Tappan and, um, and also Angel referred to the Ivy League as mere colleges, uh, it wasn't just rivalry. It was actually true. The sheer sprawling scale of the enterprise at the University of Michigan and its very, very uh, significant commitment to research um, was quite a lot different from some of the uh, uh, smaller places, including many of the places that later become very prestigious uh, in the Ivy League. So yeah, the Michigan model was quite apparent uh, certainly some states were worried about it. They didn't want the university to have that much autonomy. Uh, so it was also a counterfactual model in some states as well. 
Uh, so the, the tables you showed uh, with respect to uh, to the increase in enrollment of women uh, was uh, was was interesting. Uh, also shows quite a significant growth in undergraduate education, uh, undergraduate enrollment uh, mm -hmm. during that same period, just overall. And I think it's just interesting that you know at this moment when there is more and more emphasis being placed on. Uh, on research, on graduate education uh, at the University of Michigan. You also have this growth in, uh, in the undergraduate enrollment and the undergraduate mission. And um, uh, there were some tensions around this, right? I mean, uh, yes. both, for, both for Tappan and for uh, Angel with respect to the public uh, perception of the institution. Can you, can you say some things about yes. that? Yes, I mean, I, I, and I want to say there was a, the, the inherent tension here. So, so when the university opened, of course, there were, there were, there were uh, wonderful teaching faculty, none of whom were really trained in their disciplines, but they were probably uh, willing to spend all of their time with the students. And I'm sure the students appreciated it or might have, perhaps they didn't want quite so much supervision. Uh, but in any case, uh, you had, a, you had a, a, a faculty that thought of itself as teachers and, and they were very, very committed to that, but they didn't really know what their disciplines were. So uh, when John Dewey came to the University of Michigan, one of, the, one of the things that he was supposed to do was to teach this kind of ethics course that had been taught for many, many years on the campus by a minister who, of course, was not trained as a philosopher. And the first thing he said was, I can't teach that class. I mean, it's not a professional class, so I can't teach it. He did begin, he taught a great range of other classes, but he said, I, this is not, you know, I cannot teach that kind of a class because I'm a philosopher, I'm not a minister. So you actually had a, a professionalization process going on here, which involved the faculty that wanted to be specialized in their teaching. They wanted to spend more time on research. They wanted to become famous for their publications and their research. They wanted to spend more time with graduate students. John Dewey, as however, and the tension was real. So Dewey used to complain that I think he was teaching, I want to say something like undergraduate six hours a day, five days a week. Uh, that would be a teaching load that would be staggered, staggering for most faculty members today. Uh, so there really was a, t a tension, and it was going to be uh, it was going it was, it was going to be a while before it was resolved. Um, but the faculty, of course, were going to be driving it in the in, in that direction. Uh, one of the things that compensated for that, in fact, was the lively intellectual life of the students themselves. So there were so many student organizations and publications and of all kinds on the campus. And in many ways, and that's been true ever forever among students, right? I mean, how many students would say honestly uh, that the most important thing in their college life was a course rather than an experience in a class and, a, and something outside of, of class? So these two things you know, kind of went together then too. Mm -hmm. So just to, uh, to come up to the present, uh, you know, and it's sort of the, now, now in the, the post-U.S. News and World Report uh, era, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, have to, I have to raise the, uh, the recent, uh, you know, admissions uh, scandals, right, uh, where, uh, where there's such a strong desire to get into, uh, uh, you know, uh, highly ranked or perceived as highly ranked institutions, uh, that people bend all sorts of rules and so forth. Uh, but as you say, there's, you know, whether those institutions are really providing uh, uh, a high quality undergraduate education is just, uh, is still sort of like a black box, right? Yeah, I mean, even the most, even the most, uh, you know, careful. So, I mean, the U.S. News Now has been evaluating, you know, undergraduate institutions since 1983. And I think most people would say that for that kind of thing, it's probably a, it's probably about as good as you can get. It's very crude. Obviously, if you're trying to rank, you know, hundreds of universities in the United States, for example, um, you've got to find something that you can talk about for every single one. It can't be the, the, the kind of the quality of the actual experience. Uh, so, for example, one of the things that it, that they rate rate universities on is the is the number is the percentage of applicants turned down. So right off the bat, you've got a tremendous incentive to have. As we just saw the headlines, by the way, in this past week that the most prestigious universities in America have turned down a record number of students this year. Well, of course they have. There's a lot of reasons for that. But keep in mind, every time they do that, they look better in the rankings. Now, this is a terrible situation. Um, but in fact, it's, 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 the, it's one of the ways that the, that the rankings actually work. So all of these statistical uh, data that are being collected by the ranking systems it's not clear that they're all uh, beneficial for the students themselves or for parents trying to make this decision. Highly ranked places may have um, actually you know, pretty unhappy undergraduate experiences. Um, and there's no way that the US News is gonna be able to figure that out. Right. So let's, uh, let's turn to some audience questions. Uh, again, uh, you know, looking at the, um, 
uh, looking at the impact of funding and this kind of uh, remarkable commitment uh, by the state uh, in the latter part of the, of the 19th century to, to fund. Uh, and of course now, over the past 50 years, we've seen certainly the diminishment, if not kind of a reversal in that uh, commitment uh, of state, report, uh, state support, a little leveling, leveling off, of course. But uh, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you think, is there hope that, uh, that, that, a, that a state like Michigan could again recommit to education as kind of a public, higher education as kind of a public good? Or is that wishful thinking? Uh, I will say that I want to I want to say that I think it's it's very important and, and when we think about public universities today I will say they are on the knife's edge financially there's no question everywhere every state in the union the public universities are on the knife edge uh, they are struggling uh, they are coming up with ingenious and less ingenious ways to survive but the fact is high quality highly ranked public universities in America are on the knife's edge financially in every state in the union. So something really important is at stake here if for people who believe in high quality uh, public university education. And that is the across the board, the retreat of states from actually funding those universities at the level that they need to stay competitive with the private. You said the, the, the scary thing about that last table that I showed with all the blue at the top and all the yellow at the bottom between the publics and privates when it comes to the expenditure per student, that's a crude measure, but it's saying something real. Uh, which is that um, the states are moving away from supporting public education, and that will have a long-term effect on uh, on their states. And of course, one of, how do we know this? Well, take a look at the developing countries. So let, let's again, let's let's talk about China. Uh, China is heavily investing in universities. Why is that? Because they're like we were in the 19th century. They believed that this was the path forward, and they're putting where their mouths are right now. Whatever else may be going on there. And here we are sitting with the best ranked universities in the world in our own country. And the funding system is gradually uh, taking the support away from them. So it's a, it's a very serious situation. And, and I honestly don't know mm -hmm. uh, what is gonna turn it around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's a question that asks uh, a little bit more about how to measure undergraduate education. And I think, uh, I think the gist of this is, uh, leaving rankings per se aside, I mean, what what you know, what would you look for uh, in terms of if you had a if you had a kid who was applying to college or about to apply, what would you be? What sorts of questions might you be asking? What would you be looking for? Uh, sure, I I, I want to say by the way that if someone was asking me, and, and I've obviously you know I've been here for a long time, I've taught a lot of students. If if you wanted to ask me what's the most important thing about a college about college selection, it's perceived goodness of fit between the student and the institution. Um, that's really the most important thing. So, what what kind of a what kind of a, a of a of a child is this, and what kind of an institution uh, is going to be a good fit for that person? I mean, obviously, scale is important here. So, a, a student who's not very outgoing, for example, might might struggle at a place that's quite large and really expects the students to do a lot. Um, there may be certain programs that are available in certain colleges and not others. Those kind of considerations are probably much more important than the question of um, whether there is a ranking that's kind of high or low. But I will say that there's another survey that actually is not about uh, the same kind of survey, and that's called the National Survey of Student Engagement. Uh, that was actually done by the School of Education at, the, uh, at Indiana University, and they do an annual or every so often survey of what are the, are the, are the, what are the um, characteristics of undergraduate courses and coursework that produce the most intellectual engagement by undergraduate students. And they've actually discovered a kind of a set of the best intellectual experiences uh, that students can have and how they have shown that they actually can be proven to have an impact on the, on the engagement of the student uh, in that college or university. Uh, they, for, for example, include things like freshman seminars, like intensive writing courses in the upper level, et cetera. This is actually a really interesting survey uh, of schools and colleges that, that rates them on whether or not they provide these uh, these experiences, how much time students spend on them, what happens there, that actually is a pretty good, uh, a pretty good indicator of the, of the quality of the actual classroom experience for a lot of, um, a lot of students. That's the National Survey of Student Engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. Uh, to what degree did 
to what degree did extracurricular activities and or postgraduate endeavors of alumni contribute to the rise of the university or to the reputation of the university? So uh, these are obviously very important. By the way, let me start with part of this starts with scale. So of course, one of the things about being big was you have a lot of alums. Uh, and that, by the way, is alums in everyday life and also alums in academic positions. So of course, Michigan was has the largest probably still has the largest living alumni body on earth. So just the scale of that group and the fact that it's all over the country and all over the world um, is actually important. So, so first thing is just scale. Uh, just on average, there's going to be a lot of Michigan people everywhere you go because of the size of the University of Michigan became quite large quite early. Uh, that's going to clearly have an impact. They're going to be rating other universities because they're faculty members elsewhere. They're going to be successful in a variety of ways, and they're going to raise the, oh, where did you go to school, Michigan, et cetera. So yes, it's very, very important. Now, it's not important. It's not very important in these ranking systems, because how would you measure it? Uh, so this is the difference. So the rankings, one of the ranking, one of the national, international rankings tries to look at the, uh, the success of alumni. Wow. Think of that trying to measure that for 1500 universities. So I would say that 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 uh, criterion gets a lick and a promise in those studies uh, rather than deep engagement. But nonetheless, there is some attempt to do that. It does make a difference, very hard to measure. And most of these uh, contemporary surveys are not able to do much with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a questioner who is going, returning uh, to the issue of the, of the decline of public support. Uh, and we know that, uh, you know, the, the percentage of uh, U of M's budget that now comes from state support is, is quite small compared to what it uh, used to be, uh, and even smaller at some other public, uh, at some other public uh, universities. Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, is, uh, is privatization in the future to the University of Michigan? Is, 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 is the future of the University of Michigan as a private institution? Sure. Uh, the, the question is often asked, and the, there's a very, very obvious answer, which is connected to this question of constitutional autonomy. The University of Michigan is an entity of the Michigan Constitution as a public university. So the one thing the university cannot do is take itself private. So just practically speaking, it is impossible for the University of Michigan to go private. Uh, the regions are an entity created in the state constitution. And therefore, if you're asking yourself, you know, what, what could the regents do that would be on the face of it unconstitutional? Well, the first thing they could do would be to try to take the university private. So it's impossible legally. Keeping in mind, leave aside the question of what would happen with the real estate and all the things that would go along with it, given the, given the age of the university, et cetera. So privatization in a real sense is impossible and unconstitutional unless the constitution was amended. And I can't imagine that happening. Uh, the question of what does it mean to be a public university that has no public funding? Uh, is a tough one, right? I mean, certainly we're headed there. There are places like this. Um, now, I, I want to say, and there are, there are places that have tried to make a deal with the state. So Virginia and Colorado got to the point where the state funding was so low, they offered a deal. If you look at state legislature, you take back the money. We'll stop getting any money from you, but you just stay out of our business. In particular, stay out of our tuition rates. Uh, and they went back and forth about these. I think Colorado kind of got more control. Uh, Michigan already has that control. So Michigan does control its own tuition setting. And most public university settings, the tuition rate is approved by somebody else after the regions do it. It might be the state legislature. And you can imagine what that's like, trying to get a tuition increase improved. So the university, the regions control both the revenue and the expenditure of the university by setting a tuition rate. So what's happening, to, but of course, this is a problem in itself because it does mean that to some extent, the decline in state funding is, is, is being made up to some extent by increases in various forms of tuition. The University of Michigan's outstate tuition now approximate that uh, of some of the most expensive private schools in the country, a natural outgrowth of the withdrawal of, of in-state tuition. In-state tuition is an astonishing bargain in that respect. So if you're asking how much does it cost to go to the 25th best university in the world, most times it's a lot more than what you would pay in in-state tuition. So it's a bargain, but it's still going up. And of course, that's a big challenge. So I think the university leadership since the 1980s, the Great Recession of the early 1980s, have been struggling with this, how to maintain quality without. And I'd be one, let's be, be, uh, give credit where credit is due. One thing that's been phenomenally important has been private giving. So the rise and, and its success of multiple fundraising campaigns by the university has had a huge impact 
on its ability to stay at the rank that it is at a time when state funding has gone down so low. But at the same time, there has been a, obviously a significant increase in intuition and that's been a problem for a lot of people. So maybe one last question, um, and I know historians uh, are not keen on talking about the future, but uh, but we have now, as you, as you pointed out, this plethora of um, of, uh, of rankings, just tons and tons of rankings. Is is this a bubble that's going to burst at some point? I mean, uh, is the market over? Uh, is the rankings market oversaturated? Can it, given given this really just massive number of rankings? Uh, uh, can they have? Can they continue to have a kind, the kind, the same kind of effect on uh, on on universities internally? Yeah, I mean, I I think that's a good question. I mean, so 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 this is a question, of course, uh, that, that will be answered by the by the by the corporations that own the ranking services. I mean, so and by the way, I I don't know the answer to that question. For example, I've often asked myself, so does the U.S. News really? You know, how much do they make on this on these rankings? Now, you know what their strategy has been. They now rank everything. So they rank hospitals, they rank all kinds of things. Uh, and of course they charge for all these. If you wanna get the, you know, the gold membership to the US News website for all these ranks, you're gonna pay quite a bit of money. Um, and all these other are doing the same thing. So they're, they're moving horizontally. They're now rating more and more entities that they can, that they can, get, they can get ratings for. And that's, when, that's their strategy. I, I personally wonder, yeah, I mean, I wonder. I mean, so, so how, many, how many more rankings can there be? Uh, so for example, um, you know, there's Business Week has one. Not, one. One symptom of this, by the way, is the consolidation of the industry. So the Times Higher Education is now merged with the Wall Street Journal. So that's now a Times Higher Education Wall Street Journal ranking. Um, the uh, uh, two of the other three international organizations, ranking organizations that I mentioned, are connected with Elsevier, the important publisher in Europe. So there's a consolidation going on in the industry because basically, I do think it's probably true that standing alone ranking services are, are struggling. Uh, so I would say that, yes, the number of rankings will, will stop uh, at, at a certain point. There'll be a consolidation, which is already underway. There'll be fewer of them, but they will still uh, be important, I think. And the very fact that they're financially stable means that they'll still be, they'll still be out there. Right, okay. Maybe we can just squeeze in one more, if that's okay. Um, this person is specifically asking about what measures uh, were used to determine that uh, the admission of women raised the raised the uh, academic quality of the uh, of the student uh, student body. Uh, the um, what 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 in every case where there were where, where coed education got going um, in the nineteenth century. Now we're talking about. Um, what was immediately seen was a proliferation of student societies that were involved in things like literary societies, rhetorical societies, these kinds of things. Those multiplied very fast when women were admitted to previously all male institutions. Now we're talking about a handful of places, but there was a real effect of that change on those campuses that went co-ed. Thank you. Well, this has been a great discussion. I really appreciate your, uh, your talking with us uh, this evening. I also want to thank uh, Lara Zeeland uh, for managing the, uh, the webinar, uh, doing a great job as always. And thanks to the audience for questions. Uh, this session will be available on our website uh, in a week or so. So you can, if you, if you want to watch it again or if you want to refer, others, refer it to others, then uh, you'll be able to do that. Uh, this actually concludes our Making Michigan series for the current uh, academic year, but I hope that you will join us uh, in the fall uh, when we continue this series in a, in a to-be-determined uh, to <laughs> format. Uh, until then, uh, you know, be safe and stay well. And thank you all, and, and good night. Thank you, Gary. Thank you.